I am so excited to go back into the bank and root for my Jaguars. And with me today, we've got Mark Lamping, president of the Jaguars, for a closer look at all things Jaguars. Mark, how you doing? I'm doing great. A lot of uh, excitement around the team. It's been reflected in terms of, uh, of the interest in, uh, in this upcoming season, and uh, players are starting to uh, make their way back to uh, the training facility, and uh, football's right around the corner. All right. And you can join the conversation, too. Call us at 549-2937 or tweet us at FCC on air. Email us at firstcoastconnect.wjct.org or message us on the First Coast Connect Facebook page. So, Mark, I was telling you before we got started that uh, I've been gone for a little bit, haven't really paid attention to football in general. Give me your best sales pitch for why this is the season to tune into the Jags. <laughs> Well, you know what? I'm not the, the one to try to overstate things at times, but, uh, you know, last year, particularly the second half of last year, was uh, a real turnaround, a lot of excitement, uh, winning the division on the last day of the, of the season and then having such a memorable uh, comeback at home in the first playoff game and then actually going to Kansas City and, and playing well. You know, for uh, Doug Peterson's first year as head coach, mm -hmm. He made uh, such a difference, and uh, Trevor Lawrence is continuing to develop. And, you know, when, when people look at, uh, at NFL teams, they usually start with the quality of the head coach and the quality of the starting quarterback. And if you have those two things, you have a chance. And I don't think there's any question we have a great combination in Doug and Trevor. Yeah, and it, sometimes it takes a while to find that combination, right? Like you go through a lot of coaches who are great, but maybe don't fit in the system. You go through a lot of uh, quarterbacks who are great, but maybe don't fit in the system. So finding the two that match. Yeah, you're right about that. And, you know, our, our, uh, our fans have had a front seat view of, uh, of the difficulty that uh, the Jaguars have had in, in putting that combination together. We, you know, had some success in uh, 2017, made it to the AFC championship game, you know, arguably should have won that game. And, Gone on to the Jaguars' uh, first Super Bowl, um, and had uh, at the time what what we believed was a a good combination, but it turned out to be just a uh, you know a one year impact, and then back to the drawing board the next year. Yeah, yeah. So just to you know fill you in on how out of the loop I am, um, I remember conversations about a training facility that uh, was was going to be built here and the debates that were happening in, in city council and all of that stuff. Um, and then you came in and sat down and I said to you, like, so uh, when's the training, uh, when, when do you start breaking ground on the training facility? And you were like, uh, it's done. Yeah. No, it was, a, it was uh, the building's open. It's, uh, you know, that uh, goes back about two years mm -hmm. when we first were talking about this. Um, in fact, it ties to a, a subject that we've been spending quite a bit of time on out in the community over the course of the past few weeks, and that's the stadium of the future. And, you know, the first step in that was uh, getting the, the football operations out of the stadium. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because you can't, you can't do anything major with the stadium if the football team is still based in there because football's a, NFL football's a 365 day a year, uh, a business. So, mm -hmm. uh, but a very good po uh, partnership with the city of Jacksonville, uh, the facility opened, or the ribbon cutting was yesterday. We have players that are reporting this week, and uh, uh, we have our first uh, open practice uh, coming up in, uh, I guess, 10 days or so, and the uh, uh, public will get a chance to come out to uh, experience what the new facility is all about. Uh, be some, it'll be so much com so much more comfortable uh, for our fans as they come watch practices. So it's, uh, it's a huge step and a very significant step for the franchise. Yeah, I've been to a, a, a couple practices, you know, way back in the day, and uh, they were always hot. And I, if, if I remember correctly, we were just standing at a, like, a, a gate, a, a chain link fence, watching what was happening. So is, is that the same experience now, or, or how has that changed? No, and that, unfortunately, that was a bit of the experience in the past. But now we have a, a new grandstand that's uh, been built. It has a, has a roof over it. So all the seats are shaded, which is good. Um, they're not aluminum benches. They're uh, fixed individual seats. Uh, we've got uh, nine really massive fans that will create a nice breeze through the shaded area and 
permanent restrooms, concession stands, uh, even a gift shop. So uh, the experience will be totally different. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you spoke about the stadium of the future. I want to uh, get down to brass tacks on that. So, like, forgive me if I'm, I'm asking you to go slow as we walk through this because I'm just trying to wrap my head around. Um, so we're talking about building a new stadium in the place of, of the bank that's there right now, right? Um, would that completely, like, are you starting from ground zero and demolishing, or are you just taking it from what's there and, like, making it better? Yeah, let's, uh, you know, go back through the process, mm -hmm. you know, just, just to set the stage. The, the current stadium is, is owned by the city of Jacksonville. The city of Jacksonville has the responsibility to maintain it, to pay for the capital improvements, and if there's a decision made at some point to replace the stadium, that's the basic responsibility of the city of Jacksonville. You know, we started talking about the importance of dealing with the stadium back in 2016. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's that important of an issue. And then three years ago, we began a formal process in partnership with the city to, to work on a solution. The first thing that we tried to do was an assessment of the current stadium mm -hmm. with the idea that if the structural systems of the stadium are sound, uh, then that will make it possible uh, to be able to, to, to meet our needs through a renovation mm -hmm. of the existing stadium versus building a new stadium. And that was, a, that was an important consideration because it's, it's significantly more expensive to build a new stadium uh, versus renovating a stadium, you know, not to mention the, the, uh, the sustainability advantages of reusing a lot that's already there. So uh, we came to the conclusion that renovation was a possibility. Uh, we then um, uh, uh, distributed surveys to our customers, asked them what they wanted to see in a renovated stadium. We talked to other stakeholders like the University of Florida, the University of Georgia, the Gator Bowl. We talked to concert promoters about what, you know, what, what improvements to the stadium would convince you to bring more and more events, major mm -hmm. events, to downtown Jacksonville. And then once we had that, we, ended up, we came up with a list. It was about 24 items that we felt were really important that this new renovated stadium had to deliver. There's a lot of obvious things like shade on the seats, particularly on the east side of the stadium, yep. wider concourses, make it easier to get from level to level. And we engaged eight sports architects from coast to coast. We gave them that list. We paid them some money. We asked them to come back in four months, which they did with their ideas on how they would renovate it. We cut that list of eight down to two. At that point in time, we engaged a construction manager to work alongside these architects so that that construction manager could confirm that what they're designing can actually be built, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what would be the sequencing of that construction schedule, and then what would a rough order of magnitude estimated cost of that. Um, you know, we, we, we ultimately chose uh, a one architect, HOK, um, and then we had a plan that we uh, released to the public you know, I guess uh, about six, eight weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that point, uh, we then took that plan. We scheduled 16 uh, what we call community huddles, public meetings across uh, all of Jacksonville. We, we had at least one in every uh, city council district um, and basically provided more information uh, to the public. They were free of charge. Uh, they were scheduled, you know, a lot of them were scheduled at noontime. A lot was scheduled in the evening. We had them during the week. We had them on weekends. Actually, had one on a holiday, mm -hmm. and just finished that process. Uh, we got great feedback in terms of uh, suggestions on, on how to improve the plan. And in fact, we just uh, released uh, uh, yesterday the uh, the summary of the findings over uh, you know through that public comment period. So, you know, we're at the, we're at the point now where we have a have have a plan that uh, is better than what it started with, and now it's a question of uh, engaging with the city of Jacksonville to see if we can find common ground on a plan that works for the city, mm -hmm. works for the residents, works for the Jaguars, and will get approved by the National Football League. And what's the price tag on that? The price tag on the renovation of stadiums between one point three and one point four billion dollars. One point three and one point four. And so how much of that would the taxpayers of Duval County be paying? Well ultimately I guess it depends on the negotiations, you know, with the city. Uh -huh. Um you know, if you look at comparable markets, mm -hmm. and that will be an important consideration sure. for the National Football League, and you look at markets like, uh, let's say, Buffalo, let's look at Nashville that have recent agreements, those were generally in the 60% public, 40% private range. Mm -hmm. 
you know, what's going to happen here is ultimately going to be determined by 20 people, the yeah. mayor and then the 19 uh, city council members. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, uh, you know, a good string of experience in working with the city. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Miller Electric Center, the practice fil- facility, uh, is the latest example of that. Mm-hmm. That practice facility is actually owned by the city of Jacksonville. The Jaguars contributed 50% of the cost of that city-owned uh, facility. Uh, we signed a long-term lease to use that uh, uh, facility. And uh, we took responsibility for overseeing the construction. And along with that, we took the responsibility if there were any cost overruns to, to pay those cost overruns. So that was the model we had with the Miller Electric Center, same model we had in the construction of uh, Daly's Place and the Flex Field and also the last round of stadium improvements. So we have a track, rec- track record of working with the city on constructing city-owned assets. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that will be uh, the basis of our negotiations once we sit down with the city. Yeah. You said uh, that you signed a, a long-term lease for the, the practice, um, the practice field. Uh, if the city council and the mayor approve whatever deal that you guys create, does that tie the Jackson, uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars to the city longer? Like, is, is there an extension on how long the Jaguars can stay here? Absolutely. That'll be one of the key conditions of any agreement. Yeah. Uh, really from both perspectives, you know, if the, if the city's, if, if the city's going to invest in a new city owned stadium mm-hmm. and in this particular case, they have a willing investor to join them in mm-hmm. the case of the, of the Jaguars, the city's going to want to make sure that they have a tenant in that stadium for a long, for a long period of time. And from our perspective, if, 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 if Shad is going to invest hundreds of millions of dollars into a city owned stadium that he does not own, he's going to want to make sure that the team has the ability to play there. So, you know, we would expect there would be a long-term a lease between the Jaguars and the city that would, you know, ensure uh, Jaguars football here in Northeast Florida for, you know, generations to come. Yeah. Question. Um, the stadium would be owned by the city. Um, the Jaguars would be the primary leaseholder. Um, Jaguars, you know, are in season, I guess you could say from like August to January, right? So like in the times that the Jaguars are not playing games, um, who gets the revenue from the use of the, the stadium? Well, that would be to be negotiated. Okay. You know, um, and that's one of the goals of this, 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 stadium of the future plan mm-hmm. number one we want a stadium that's going to provide the greatest benefit to this community so obviously he- keeping the jaguars here for for decades to come you know is a is a positive thing but that but that's only one thing and as you rightly pointed out that's only 10 games or so a year mm-hmm. um you know for us for, for this stadium to have the maximum impact on this community it needs to be the type of stadium that's going to attract a lot of major events here to Jacksonville uh, during the rest of the year. Right. For example, during the summer, that's that's the major concert uh, uh, season. It, there's no reason why Jacksonville shouldn't be a more active participant in those types of uh, those types of events. So, um, uh, the design of the stadium is such that uh, it it will position the stadium to be. Uh, more attractive to people that are bringing events that in fact that's why we talk to parties like concert promoters right to get feedback from them on what is the stadium's is what is the stadium missing that's keeping you from bringing more concerts here each and every year same thing with talking to the university of florida university of georgia gator bowl all of those that are non-jaguar entities but have a, a a big stake in terms of what happens to the stadium I'm talking to Mark. Lam- <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm talking to Mark Lamping, president of the Jacksonville Jaguars. You can join the conversation too at five four nine two nine three seven. You can tweet us at FCC on air. First Coast Connect at wjct.org, or you can find us on Facebook. And I'm going to take a caller. Mark, please keep it on topic and keep it brief. Hey, Mark. Hey, good morning. Um, I'm not a big Jaguar fan. I've been to exactly one game in your entire. Hold on, Mark. Mark, here. can you hold on one second? We're we're having a little bit of technical di- difficulties. Mark can't hear. In his Hello? headphones. Hold on one second. Okay. Okay. Let's see now. Can you? 
Yeah, we can hear now. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, Mark. Please, please start over because uh, the other Mark couldn't hear you. Thank you. Testing, testing, testing. Um, I'm not a big Jaguar fan. I've been to two games since you guys have been here. You guys could haul off to London tomorrow, and it wouldn't affect me one way or the other. But I do realize, and I mean, I think I think it's immoral, basically, that uh, one of the ten richest men on the planet wants us, the poor citizens of Jacksonville, to pay for. Yeah, his stadium. I know we own it, but it's your stadium. But anyway, here's, I do realize that a lot of people in Jacksonville just love their Jaguars. And uh, I, I'm, I'm resigned to the fact that you guys are going to get it built. But uh, I want, if you're going to do that, you're basically asking the citizens of Jacksonville to be your bank. And when you go to a bank for a loan, you have to open up your books. You have to tell them what you owe and what you're getting in you know, for revenue and all these things. And professional football teams never want to do that, which is worrisome to me, um, especially since in light of a Sports Illustrated article I read a long time ago, and Jacksonville gives the Jaguars far more money than just about every team in the league as far as percentages of parking and tickets and all that other revenue. Mark, my friend, so, what's your question? So if we give you that money, would you please open up your books to uh, the city auditor to see you know, what you're making off of us? Thank you, Mark. Yeah, let me, uh, well, first, I appreciate your, uh, your, your comments. And as we've uh, gone through our process in terms of public meetings, uh, certainly encourage uh, you to make your, uh, your views known to uh, uh, ultimately the people are going to decide if there are tax dollars invested in this. So that would be the mayor and the 19 uh, city council members. So encourage you to be, uh, be part of the process. And you know, I would also encourage those people that uh, may, might view this differently than you, uh, 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 to be just as uh, involved in the process. So uh, let, me, let me try to, to, to focus on that topic as it relates to tax dollars going into this facility. Um, there is, there is uh, uh, no question that any investment of tax dollars, particularly the magnitude of dollars that are being discussed in this context, needs to receive the most extensive review uh, from those that ultimately will determine whether the investment is going to, to happen or not. And that's, that's, that's justifiable, and that absolutely should happen. But as part of that discussion, you know, you, you referenced that the city owns the stadium. Uh, they have responsibility for the stadium. Keep in mind that there's another side to this, to this coin, and that is you've got a willing participant, uh, someone who believes in downtown Jacksonville, that is prepared to invest an unprecedented amount of money in downtown Jacksonville, a billion dollars in downtown Jacksonville, be the single largest private investment in the history of, of uh, Jacksonville. And when you, when, you, when you look at the list of, of people that are prepared to make that type of commitment to downtown Jacksonville, it's pretty much limited to one person right now, and that's, and that's Shad Khan. So, Obviously, uh, this will be some type of private-public partnership between the two parties. Uh, what that partnership looks like will be part of a negotiation. Uh, we certainly would hope that we would get to a successful conclusion, as does, as does the city, but that remains to be seen. But at the end of the day, you know, you're looking at a huge investment in downtown Jacksonville, an investment that uh, could be generational in terms of its impact. I think one of the things that Mark was, was trying to hit on, though, is that he believes, and I don't know if this is true or not, but he believes that NFL teams do not open up their books to show like how much revenue they're, they're generating and creating and so forth and so on. And would the Jaguars or do, do the Jaguars have to open up their books in order for something like this to happen? No, we don't. A private company, yeah. uh, just like other private companies, have no obligation to uh, you know, reveal their operations. Um, you know, that's why I think uh, uh, the decision that uh, Mayor Deegan has made to bring in experts mm -hmm. in the industry that can advise the city, mm -hmm. that can provide the estimates and probably very accurate estimates as to what the operations of teams look like. You know, I think that's a very good move. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that, uh, that is out there is, you know, there's 32 NFL teams. You know, this is, Jacksonville is not the only market that has an NFL team. And I think it's important to understand you know, what is happening across all of those markets, particularly those, those markets that are similar to Jacksonville, mm -hmm. smaller markets in the National Football League. Yeah. I think, you know, following the line of what Mark was saying, that um, I agree with you that Shaq Khan is looking to, do, to invest 
massive amounts of money into Jacksonville. But I think that um, what people who are against this idea would say is that like, if he was willing to put that much money into Jacksonville, there must be an upside that he's going to make a lot of money from it. And, and what does the city and the taxpayers see from that income? Well, that's a, that's a fundamental question that has to do with public policy. Mm -hmm. You know, as we sit here today, the city of Jacksonville has a economic development policy that involves private public partnerships. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, it doesn't say that, you know, you should only invest with companies that are losing money. In fact, I think that'd be a pretty poor direction to go. It doesn't say that you should treat companies that are owned by wealthy people any differently than, than those that, that, that may not be. And, you know, let's use the, the, a, a great example. Okay. Let's use Amazon. You know, Amazon, you know, when they brought their first distribution center here into Jacksonville, you know, the city participated in helping make that happen because mm -hmm. they, they had to do it to be able to earn that. And since that time now that we have a, a, a number of distribution centers and thousands of jobs have been brought here to Jacksonville. Okay. I don't remember any discussions about Jeff Bezos back. One of the richest people in the entire world flies his own rockets and his involvement with Amazon somehow would preclude a discussion, mm -hmm. you know, to, to try to bring that to Jacksonville. So at, at the end of the day, this is going to be decided, as I said, by, by the mayor. It's not going to be decided by me or Shad and the 19 city council members. Yeah. And they're the ones that need to be accountable to the citizens. We're going to take a call. Uh, Kevin from Nakati, please keep it on topic and keep it brief. Yeah. Yes. Good morning, uh, Mr. Lamping. Uh, I'm calling from Nakati, and I just want to say that I live in the 15% of Nocatee that's in Duval County that nobody realizes we're here, and we sure have enjoyed having one of your huddles down here. That aside, my question that I told the producer is, how is it the New York Islanders were able to build a $1.1 billion arena next to Belmont Racetrack without one penny of government money coming in? It was all private. Uh, very simple. They live in the largest uh, market in the United States. Uh, the depth of that market, the size of the economy, the number of corporate headquarters there, the average uh, or the, the, the potential number of customers they have in that market, and that is not inconsistent. That also applies to the National Football League. If you look at stadiums that are built in big markets, the public is a very small participant in the construction of those stadiums. The other fact that is irrefutable is that when, when stadiums in the National Football League are built in small markets, the public is a, is a major participant. The economies of those, of those smaller markets pale in comparison to the economic opportunities that uh, those teams, whether it's an NHL team or, or an NBA team or NBA or Major League Basketball team, the opportunities they have by being in huge markets. And we're going to take one more call, caller, Charlie from the Beaches. Keep it brief and keep it on topic. Hey, Charlie. Hey, guys. You guys were mentioning the construction, the building, etc. I wonder if you could please tell me. How many plumbers, carpenters, laborers, Uber drivers, how many of people will be employed in Jacksonville, carpenters and electricians? Can you tell me what benefits those industries will have and how many people will that employ? Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, um, let me, that, that's, a, that's a very timely question. In fact, it had an interesting conversation yesterday with uh, Henry Brown, who's uh, the CEO of uh, one of Jacksonville's great historic companies in terms of Miller Electric. And a, uh, a, a project of this magnitude would require for just the, just the element of work that a company like Miller Electric or another electrical contractor would be doing would require up to 500 electricians per day to be working on that project. And in this case, it would be for a period of, of uh, 30 months. So you multiply that, you know, by each of the other building trades, and there'll be thousands of people working on site each and every day. And, and you know, our, our focus, and I'm sure the city's focus, would be to make sure that the agreement between the two parties would uh, position local companies and make sure that wherever it's possible, uh, that not only do we use local companies, particularly emerging companies, but that those people that are working on site are actually live here in Jacksonville. Mark Lamping, president of the Jaguars, thank you so much for coming in. We'll be right back.